Good morning. Good morning. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let the church say amen. Amen. In the case of our speaker for today's and tomorrow's presentations, there is very little need for a formal introduction. He is one of us. Bishop Mark Webb's roots go back to Williamsport and to his home church, St. John's United Methodist Church. He is a graduate of Shippensburg University and Asbury Theological Seminary. He has served several congregations within our annual conference and most recently as the York District Superintendent. He has served, yes, woo. <laughs> He has served as our pastor, our colleague and friend, or our district superintendent, including a time as a dean of the cabinet. He has addressed this body of the annual conference many times in the past. We have learned from his wisdom and shared in his ministry. Perhaps the highest tribute that I could offer about him is that in 2012, last year, our speaker was chosen as the first Episcopal nominee for the newly created Susquehanna Annual Conference. That was the strongest affirmation how much this annual conference love him and respect and honor him for his gifts and graces for ministry and for Episcopal leadership for such a time as this. Last July in Charleston, West Virginia, he was elected and consecrated as a bishop of the church and then consequently received his assignment to the Upper New York Annual Conference, where he is serving now with distinction. He and his wife, Jody, and their two sons, Tyler and Benjamin, moved to the land where God has chosen for them to live and to serve. I understand from some of his closest friends and colleagues that he was kidded upon his election that he should purchase a t-shirt that reads, I went to West Virginia and all I got was this pen. <laughs> His election to Episcopacy is so very special and significant to us. It has been 40 years since the former Central Pennsylvania Annual Conference produced a bishop and he is the first bishop out of the Susquehanna Annual Conference. Another intriguing thing about his election was that Bishop Jane Middleton was the presiding bishop when his election happened. At that time, I didn't have any clue that I was going to come to the Susquehanna Annual Conference, but I also had a very special and personal connection to Bishop Webb's election. When you have a personal time with Bishop Webb, ask him who prayed just before his election. <laughs> no prayer, no election. Sisters and brothers, laity and clergy, friends and colleagues of the Susquehanna Annual Conference, it is my great joy that I present to you one of your own who has come back to be our teacher and friend once again, Bishop Mark Webb of the Upper New York Annual Conference. Just one second, just one second. Jody, where are you? Jody, where are you? All right, would you please stand? And let the whole body will just stand and welcome Jody and Bishop Webb among us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. It is such a joy and a privilege to be with you. Your brothers and sisters in Upper New York are just wonderful people. And the opportunity that we have had over these last few months to be in ministry and mission with them has truly been a rich experience and a blessing. But 
Dorothy had it right. There's no place like home. And uh, it's good to be home. And thank you for inviting me. And Bishop Park, thank you uh, so very much. I hope that you know how gifted and blessed you are in the one who has been called to be your bishop uh, in this place at this time. Bishop Park is a person of great spiritual depth, of passion for Jesus Christ and for the church. He is a gift uh, to you and to all who know him. And you maybe have already done this, but I want to encourage you to do it as often as you can, uh, to share your appreciation uh, to Bishop Park for his gifts and his leadership. And it's okay to hoot and holler when you share that appreciation, but let Bishop Park know how much you love him. Anytime I have a prayer request now, I call Bishop Park first. <laughs> During our time together, we're going to focus on two topics. I've chosen this morning the topic on a journey of faith, choosing the necessary things. And tomorrow, our focus is going to be on a journey of faith, focusing on the destination. And as we prepare to be encountered by the word of God, to be changed by God's word. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you for your presence in our lives and in this place, for the power of your Holy Spirit, for the truth of your grace that renews us and makes us new in every moment of every day. We thank you for your word, for its power, its conviction, its challenge, its comfort, its boldness, and its truth. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts, minds, and spirits that are open, that somehow, some way, in spite of me, in spite of us, we will be different because we heard your word today. And we'll live a different kind of life as we strive to be your people and your church. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, here's a quote that you might be very familiar with. As a matter of fact, for some of you, it might bring back fond memories. For others, it might bring back nightmares. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. You know where that's from. Those opening lines from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. They give us a glimpse of the novel central tension between love and family on the one hand and oppression and hatred on the other. The book suggests that good and evil, wisdom and folly, light and darkness stand equally matched in their struggle. And the book makes prominent use of doubles. It uses doubles to get and keep the interest of its readers. There's a familiar New Testament account that also seems to use doubles to get our attention and to teach us some valuable truth. And I want us to hear that account again and spend some time focusing on what it might say to us. And I'll admit that most of what I'm sharing today, I'm sharing it because I need to hear it. And I'm inviting you to join me in my, my pain. From Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 38. Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? 
tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. The word of God for the people of God. I don't know about you, but I have really never liked this passage of Scripture. Maybe it's because of the way I read it, or maybe it's the teachings that I've heard about it, but it has always made me feel guilty. It seems to always force me to make a choice, to answer a question that seems to have a right or wrong answer. Am I a Mary or am I a Martha? I also find the placement of this account in the Gospel of Luke interesting. You might remember that earlier in the 10th chapter of Luke, we hear Jesus answer the question of the lawyer. The lawyer asked, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus returns that question with another question. What does the law say? The lawyer responds, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your strength and all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus affirms that answer, but the the lawyer presses the issue and asks, Who is my neighbor? And then Jesus replies with the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then we're thrust into the visit of Jesus with Mary and Martha. And it feels like we're forced to choose. The priest and the Levite, in the account of the Good Samaritan, believed they were doing the right thing. According to the law, they were doing the right thing. The injured man may have been dead. And touching him would have rendered them ceremonially unclean. Martha believed she was doing the right thing. She was living up to social expectations, being the proper hostess. This section of scripture is not about choosing good over bad. It's about making sure the good does not crowd out the best. And when we look at this chapter and this account in Luke in that way, I believe it opens it up for us in a very fresh and new way. Mary and Martha, the parable of the Good Samaritan, It is about our primary focus. Who or what has our attention the majority of the time? By what are we driven as we live out our relationship with God and as we live out our call to ministry? Is our primary focus driven by the expectations of society or expectations of our church members? or expectations of our pastor, or expectations of our bishop, or our DS, or expectations of ourself? Or is our primary focus driven by the identity of our God and who we are in relation to God? Martha sees her sister Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus while she's out in the kitchen busting her butt. And she can't take it anymore. She runs into Jesus and lets it rip. She wants Jesus to set Mary straight. Lord, tell my sister to help me. Did you hear what Jesus said? Look at it again. Martha, Martha. You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better. 
God has called us to ministry, brothers and sisters. God has called us to good works. God has called us to live and be in the midst of the world. God has called us to be United Methodist pastors and laity with all that brings with it. But our ministry, our good works, our responsibilities and expectations and the strategies we try to fulfill all of those things, they can never be the focus. They must not be the focus. The call upon our lives is to focus upon who we are, upon who we are promised to become in and through our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Everything else flows from that. You may have heard this story before. It's a story about a little boy who heard that the circus was coming to town. He had never seen the circus. And he so desperately wanted to go. And so he ran home after school and he said to his mom and dad, did you know the circus is coming on Saturday? Can I go? Please, can I go? And dad looked at him and said, well, I'll tell you what, if you get up Saturday and finish all of your chores, I'll make sure that you have some money so that you can go to the circus. Saturday morning came, and that little boy was up before the sun rose. And when his parents came down for breakfast, all his chores had been completed, and he was sitting at the kitchen table in his Sunday best. He was ready to go to the circus. Dad reached into his pocket and pulled out a dollar bill and handed it to his son, and his son held that in his hand. He had never had that much money at one time. And he ran out the door and headed toward town where the circus was. His feet didn't even touch the ground. He was so excited. And as he got closer to town, he, he realized that all these people were crowding the main streets. And so he pushed his way through the crowd, and what he saw in front of him was unimaginable. He saw sights he had never seen before. Because, you see, he was witnessing the parade, the circus parade. He watched as wild animals rolled by. He watched as acrobats did their routines in the streets. He heard the band play. He watched this whole parade mesmerized. And then the end of the parade came, the traditional circus clown with floppy shoes. And as that clown approached the little boy, he walked over to the clown, reached in his pocket, pulled out the dollar bill, and handed it to the clown, and turned around and went home. What had happened? That little boy thought he had been to the circus, when in reality, all he had experienced was the prey. All he had experienced was, was what was leading up to what he so anticipated being a part of. I believe one of the major issues the church faces, perhaps the major issue, is that we've allowed ourselves to focus upon the good at the neglect of the best. God has called us to the circus, and we've been content to experience the parade. We don't have a strategy problem in our church, churches, brothers and sisters. Our struggle as a denomination is not because we lack programs. Our difficulties, I believe, aren't even because we have a leadership crisis. Our issue in the church is a spiritual one. We have a spiritual problem that we need to address. Intentional or unintentional, forced or accepted, we found ourselves too busy in the kitchen to sit at the feet of Jesus. And I believe, I believe it's time for that to change. 
And it's time for those who are sitting at the feet of Jesus to help those of us stuck in the kitchen so that together we can claim who we are and in that help to become the leaders and the church that God desires us to be. God is calling us to be a Martha with the seeking heart of a Mary and to be a Mary with the servant heart of a Martha. It's not either or. How do we do that? It's easy to say that. How do we do that? We've got to claim the truth that we are on a journey of faith. And we must trust that we can choose the necessary things uh, for that journey. I want you to watch a video uh, that I brought along. There's a key truth that I want you to look at that's going to be on the screen. A journey of faith is allowing ourselves to trust the heart of God so that our heart can be captured and transformed. Spiritually speaking, the heart isn't about the vital, vital physical organ that keeps the blood circulating throughout our bodies. Spiritually speaking, the heart is that innermost part or area of our lives. The part of us that we guard with all that we have. The part that holds our greatest desires as well as our deepest secrets and fears. A journey of faith is about that part being captured by Jesus. A journey of faith is about that part being owned by Jesus and then transformed, developed, and grown. Remember the words from the prophet Isaiah? Look at these. You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. Paul and the letter to Romans, chapter 10, said this, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, of a, person, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth they confess, resulting in salvation. Galatians 4, But when the fullness had, of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Ephesians 3, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to the fullness of A journey of faith is about the heart of God colliding with our heart. A journey of faith is about that innermost part of our lives being transformed, radically transformed, so that we experience the reality of our creation and the reality of our purpose. It's a journey that we've got to choose individually, but it's a journey that we share corporately. It's a journey that makes us gods and then allows us to be used by God in the lives of others so that they too might have a heart collision with God. 
I want to spend the rest of our time this morning talking about some of the necessary things that we've got to choose if we're going to experience this journey of faith, this collision of our heart with God's heart. And the first thing I believe we have to choose, we must choose grace. As Wesleyans, as United Methodist Christians, we have an amazing theology of grace. We talk about grace all the time. We preach about it. We even sing about it. We know and believe that grace is at the heart of our relationship with God. Grace is what allows us to understand who God is. Grace allows us to be drawn closer to God, to love God more, and to become the people that God desires us to be. We know grace so well, we've created amazing definitions to define it and describe it. Here are a couple of them. Grace means that God gives me what I need, not what I deserve. Grace is everything for nothing for those who don't deserve anything. We quote scriptures that point us to the truth of grace. Scriptures like Romans 3, 23 and 24, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. We shout Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace that we have been saved through faith. It's not from ourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works. So no one can boast. Grace is a word and a concept that we toss around a whole lot in the church. We have an amazing theology of grace. The problem is, we don't always believe what we know and preach. Those of us in the church, sometimes I believe we're trying to live the mission that extends the power of grace when we have not fully allowed the power of grace to be claimed and owned in our lives. I lived in Kentucky for three years when I went to seminary. And I remember the first time I went to breakfast in the dining hall at Asbury Theological Seminary. And they put this stuff on my plate. I had no idea what it was. It was sand color <laughs> and runny. They call them grits. I called them yuck. <laughs> I hated grits. All three years, I'd try them every once in a while. Nothing changed my mind. I didn't like them. But then when I served at Aldersgate Church in Mechanicsburg at a men's breakfast, I was introduced to grits with cheese. <laughs> Bishop Park cheese makes everything better. <laughs> and that reminded me of a story of a guy who went to a restaurant and he ordered breakfast and he ordered two eggs, toast, and hash browns. And when his breakfast came, there was this brownish, yellow, runny stuff on his plate. And he looked at the waitress and said, well, what is this? And she said, well, they're grits. He said, I don't want them. She said, well, you get them anyhow. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm not going to pay for them. And she said, well, you don't have to pay for them. They're, they just come with your breakfast. Well, I'm not going to eat them. <laughs> and the waitress looked at him and said, well, you know, that's fine. You can eat them or you can leave them there. I don't care. Just consider it a gift. If 
if we're going to be alive in Christ, we, we've got to consider the gift. We, we've got to stop playing around the margins of God's grace and fully allow it to collide with our hearts. We've got to believe it, claim it, choose it. I hate to say this, but I believe it's true. There are too many people sitting in too many of our churches for too many years who have yet to fully trust the promise of God's grace. As we talk about being transformed by God, about becoming that which God claims for us, we need to claim the simple yet powerful truth that God meets us right where we are. God doesn't wait for us to get our act together. God doesn't wait for us to get our life cleaned up. God meets us and accepts us just as we are. And then says, watch out. Watch how my grace is going to move in your life. How my grace is going to transform you. And make you all that you desire to be. You know, this is important. I know it sounds simple, but it's important. Because there are some in this room today who do not believe that God loves them unconditionally. There are some here today who can't imagine that God will accept them because of where they've been or what they've done or who they are. There are some here today in this room who are still trying to earn God's favor by what they do. And you see, because those of us in this room struggle with accepting God's grace for our own lives because we don't believe that God can love us unconditionally, then there's no way we believe that God will love our neighbor. You know that guy with all the tattoos? That girl that seems to have everything pierced? That teenager that just is in trouble? Because we have not fully claimed the grace of God in our lives, we're not able to extend it. We're not able to, to share the truth of it in the way that God calls us to. You know, every once in a while you encounter a book that needs to be read and reread and reread. And one of those books for me is Henry Nowen's Life of the Beloved. I've been reading it every year since 2007. It's a book of being. It's a book about claiming who you are in God, not what you do for God. It's about understanding that God calls us beloved. Nowen says, being the beloved is the origin and the fulfillment of the life of the Spirit. He goes on to say, from the moment we claim the truth of being the beloved, we are faced with the call to become who we are. If you don't deal with the truth of grace, you never get to the truth of being God's beloved. Nowen as he lays out this truth, offers three important reminders or steps. He says, to become the beloved, we have to claim that we are taken. Greet each other this week, and, and when you greet each other, remind each other, you're taken. You're taken by God. Now instead, you have to keep looking for people and places where that truth is spoken and where you're reminded of your deepest identity as the chosen one. Run towards people who are owned and claimed by grace and are expressing that grace to others. Run towards them. 
run away from those that are not. And now it says you have to celebrate your chosenness constantly. That means saying thank you to God for having chosen you and thank you to all who remind you of your chosenness. So my brothers and sisters in the Susquehanna Conference, thank you. Thank you for reminding me of my chosenness. For almost 25 years, you reminded me of my chosenness. You reminded me of my status, not as a pastor in the United Methodist Church, but as a beloved child of God. You might remember that earlier I said our problem as a church is a spiritual one. I really believe that. If we could deal with the gap between our theology of grace and our experience of grace, this church of ours would awaken in a way that none of us can imagine. And the world will be transformed for the glory of God. So a necessary thing, we've got to choose grace. A second necessary thing, we must choose a growing faith. There was a man who went to his psychiatrist and pleaded with him, said, you've got to help me. And the psychiatrist says, well, what's the matter? He says, it's my son. So what's wrong with your son? He said, well, you know, I I come down in the morning and I head out to work and my son's in the backyard and he's eating mud pies. And I, I come home at lunchtime and he's in the backyard and he's eating mud pies. And I come home for dinner. And he's in the backyard, and he's eating mud pies. And the psychiatrist said, well, you know, I wouldn't worry about it too much. He'll, he'll eventually grow out of that. And the man looked at his psychiatrist and said, well, maybe. But I just don't like it, and neither does his wife. <laughs> you have to think about that one a little bit. faith still at the starting line. If we're going to be on this journey of faith that God has called us to, we've got to put in our lives the things that will allow our faith to grow deeper and deeper, more and more each day. The folks in the York District have heard me say this before, uh, but it's a great analogy I used to go around to the churches and and I would say, how many of you have gone uh, snorkeling? How many of you have gone snorkeling? Snorkeling is an amazing experience. I remember the first time I went snorkeling. I was in Acapulco. It was amazing. You could keep your head underwater and see all this stuff. I thought snorkeling was the best thing ever until I went scuba diving. How many of you have gone scuba diving? Would you agree that once you've gone scuba diving, snorkeling just doesn't cut? Here's the thing, church. God has called us to a life of scuba diving. We're content to stay at the surface in our spiritual journeys, in our faith. God's calling us to the depths. If we're going to be on this journey of faith in the way that God has called us, We've got to have a faith that's growing. That means we've got to be in the Word, individually and together, daily. We've got to be growing in the the disciplines of prayer and fasting and worship. We've got to be in fellowship with one another, not so that we can eat turkey dinners and have chicken barbecues. Those are important. But the purpose of our fellowship is so that we can hold one another accountable. Because you can't have accountability apart from relationship, otherwise it's judgment. But we have fellowship so that we can help one another go deeper, grow farther in our faith. And we need to continue to grow in the giving of our lives for service, and that doesn't happen one day a week. One of my all-time favorite stories 
is about a man who was, went to an evangelist one day and said, how can my church, how can my community have revival? And the evangelist said to the man, do you have a place where you can go and pray? And the man said, yes. And the evangelist said, well, go to that place and take a piece of chalk with you. And when you get to that place, kneel down and with that chalk, draw a circle around you. And then pray that God will bring revival to everything inside that circle. And then your church will know revival and your community will experience revival. The church, we will not live our mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world until we allow God to transform us totally, completely. We've got to choose a growing faith. Another necessary thing we have to choose is we've got to choose to live boldly. Paul said in Romans 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In Matthew, Jesus said this. I don't like to read this verse. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him or her, when they come in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. God needs people. We need to be a church that's bold in our faith, not ashamed to live and share what we believe. Being a follower of Jesus Christ in the 21st century is not easy. Everywhere we look and in everything we experience, we find a temptation to live our faith in a timid way. One of the realities we face as the church is the world around us sees us as irrelevant. There's no difference between the way we live, the way we treat one another, the way we engage those who do not yet know Jesus than the way the world engages them. We claim to believe the greatest truth known to humanity. We claim a desire to be people changed by the love of Jesus Christ. We claim that nothing matters but Jesus. But yet so often we live as if we're ashamed of what we claim. So often we're willing to push aside or step away from who we say we are, from who we say we want to be. It's time for the church to stop allowing the world to set our agenda. We need to live boldly. If we're going to be alive in Christ together, we need to be on a journey that involves the heart. We must allow the heart of God to collide with our hearts. We've got to choose some necessary things. We've got to choose grace. We've got to choose a growing spirit. We've got to choose to live boldly there's one more thing. We've got to choose an attitude of surrender. One of the greatest barriers to me being fully alive in Jesus is my inability and unwillingness to fully surrender to God, to let go of my desires, my agenda, my plan, and to fully allow Jesus to be Lord. Oh, I love Jesus as Savior but I'm not so sure I'm as fond of Jesus as Lord. In my life, that needs to change. Maybe that's true for you. I want to end with a video that I believe speaks an amazing truth, and it's a video that makes me laugh. It's a video that makes me cry. It's a video that makes me make a choice. Watch this. God has invited us to a journey of faith. May we choose the necessary things. That we will be the people that God has called us to be. Thanks be to God. Amen.